of the uh, uh, this lecture, I'm going to concentrate mainly on the multi-objective uh, optimization. Uh, there's a bit of knowledge creation aspect that comes from solving multi-objective, which I'm going to tress, express a little bit more. Uh, uh, so uh, let's start with the multi-objective version and then part of the talk, and then we'll get to the knowledge, um, um, knowledge creation aspect. So what I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about what is multi-objective optimization, how is it different from single objective optimization. Um, uh, of course, the evolutionary algorithms we talked about, how to do evolutionary algorithms for solving these problems. And then I have decided to uh, really divide the whole development in this field into three different era. Alright, so uh, I'm going to divide the whole development in last 20 years in this area uh, into three different era, starting with the birth of this particular field. Um, as I said, it kind of began at the beginning of 90s, so I would say first 10 years, and then the era two, which is another seven, eight years from there on, and then the matured phase, which is also the advanced uh, stage of emo, starting for, uh, for about last, you know, five, six years. So, uh, so that's how I'm trying to put them, and uh, we will then do some extensions of what is uh, in the future. Okay, first of all, uh, I, towards the end of the last lecture, I gave you some hint of why we need to solve multiple objectives. I mean, it's the, it's the perception of optimization if you do with just single objective is that often single objective optimal results are too specific for that particular optimization uh, uh, objective that you have. Um, you want to look a solution, you want to find a solution from different perspective because nothing in practice has a single objective that you're always interested in. I mean, anything you do, there is always more than one goal that you have. A and often in engineering context, these are uh, cost versus quality. In most, most problems, it's cost versus quality. You never do it for only cost or never do it for only quality. Because if you do it only for cost, it may not be, uh, the, the solution that you get may not be of high quality. And if you do it for quality, it could be so expensive that it may not be practical to really implement it. So you need to make a balance. One of the things people do in that case to have both these is, they make a weight at sum of cost and quality somehow. They say we give 50% importance to cost, 50% to reliability. Um, these, these, ha these are one way that people have been solving, but these are always dangerous to do because you always wonder, what if I had done 60% weight on cost and 40% weight on, uh, on quality? Have I have gotten completely different results or they would be slightly different from what I had? So all these issues come in, which I'm going to talk a little more, but um, the main point there is not every, every objective that you have can be given a dollar value which some people think. I mean, when I started working in this about 25 years ago, uh, people would, um, I would get comments from reviewers uh, from some domain-specific journals saying, we don't believe in multi-objective because everything can be given a dollar value. Uh, that's what we are always trying to look at at the end of the day. Uh, so there, there had been an era, I would say 70s, 80s, 90s, where people would really say that if, if you are looking for quality, then how much money you are willing to pay for that? Okay, so and they would actually quantify that a 10% increase in quality is going to cost you 15% more. 20% uh, increase in quality will cost you 30% more. Or some kind of a mapping they would do and they would try to put everything under one number that is the dollar value. But those are the days. Uh, those are hand-waving way you are, you are kind of mixing quality with cost. And we all know who have worked with, or, or you know, who have, who is running a family, for example, or you are uh, doing anything in your life, you're buying a car, buying something expensive, or even day-to-day -day stuff. We always know that you cannot get a quality product by paying less. If you are paying less, means somewhere you are compromising. Now the question then is, um, how much can I compromise? 
because I cannot all the time get the, the highest quality product even though I want, so I may have to compromise. So these kinds of study can help you get an idea is that what is the trade-off between cost and quality so you can make a decision yourself. All right, so um, again, to get with the basics of these kind of problems is at least you have uh, more, at least you have two objectives in such cases when you're doing multi-objective optimization, and there is a conflict between cost and quality, cost and um, the other things that you have in mind. So um, I, was, uh, I was visiting Spain sometime, uh, I think it was two, three years ago, and um, so the, my host took me to a, to a dinner, and then we were talking about, um, you know, the shopping and uh, different topics came out. So one of the things th they told me is that people in Spain go to shop and look for a product that has a buono, bonito, barato. I don't know whether this makes sense in your language here, but is the same? Okay. So, so, so I don't have to explain to you. So this actually says good, nice, and cheap. All right, you always look for that. So I have been telling him, hey, tomorrow I'm going to give a talk that is exactly opposite to this concept. So how would people take it? Because I believe in practice you cannot find such a solution, which is good and nice. You can get good and nice solutions, but I can guarantee you it's not going to be cheap, right? So, you may, so what you probably mean is, okay, I want a good and nice solutions, but also probably not pay the cheapest price. So, so if I say good, nice, and cheapest, probably there doesn't exist such a solution, but you are looking for such a solution. This is your goal, but you have to be prepared that there may not be such a solution, right? So in the context of two conflicting objectives like we have here, for example, cost and comfort, if you're looking for the minimum cost solutions, you've got this car that looks, this red colored car that looks very cheap, right? Uh, and it costs you uh, also uh, less money, um, but then you don't get the quality. On the other hand, if you're looking for quality, you have to pay a lot so that you probably have gotten 10 different these cheap cars. So now these are two extremes when you're talking about multiple objectives, but one corresponding to the optimum of each of these objectives. But there exist lots of other solutions. Like you see here on the red line I'm showing you, solutions A, B, and C. This is, of course, a hypothetical plane, hypothetical region I'm talking about. But there exists not, the, not of these two extreme solutions as an optimal solutions to this problem, but there exist many other solutions. That makes a trade-off. For example, solution A and B, if I compare, solution A has a better cost than solution B, but solution B has a better comfort than A. So that's how, if this A and B solutions are given to you, uh, you cannot just say, I like, or or A is better than B. You may like one of them, but you may not be able to say for sure A is better than B for everybody. Because A is better in one objective, B is better in another objective. So that's how you get the trade-off. So in these problems, there exists not one, but many optimal solutions. All those solutions in that red line. So this blue region I'm showing you, these are all possible solutions of a car that anybody can design and come up with. And that's the trade-off you see. So there is one solution I'm showing a little far away here, is what I called as a doomed car, right? That car, if somebody designs, is going to be doomed pretty quickly because I can, if I can produce, for example, car B, then car B is cheaper, it costs less than the doomed car, and car B also has a better comfort than the doomed car. So who is going to buy that car? So in that sense, all the solutions A, B, C are optimal, okay? And all other solutions that are in the blue region, it's fine, uh, is, is all the solutions in the blue region are not really optimal. So with respect to that, there is a concept of optimization, but unfortunately, there is no single optimal solutions in such cases. And there are not only, these are called dominated cars as well, there are not only this problem, when you are going and buying a mobile, you always make this trade-off that how much, a, how much big a screen that I want. The more big screen I want, the more, more frequently I have to charge it, right? So that, that's a nuisance, that I have to charge it every five hours, six hours, or at least, a, at least daily, and I often forget to charge. So, and then when I need the mobile, I see oh, there is no power in it. That happens with my camera all the time, so I stop carrying cameras anymore. So, you know, so, so that's the issue here, is that you want to do something, you want to get something at the expense of something else. You always, uh, always have that kind of thing. 
So okay, so this is this is kind of telling you the, the, the premises that there exists lots of problem solving in practice that comes with different conflicting goals and objectives. You can't get everything in one solution. That's why there are multiple solutions. Formally, these problems will have this kind of a structure that I'm showing you here. There are different objectives. Each one of them has to be minimized, maximized. Um, and then uh, there are some constraints that you have. So there are inequality constraints, there are equality constraints, variable bounds. So this is a standard mathematical description of a multi-objective problem. I, I would like to take a physical example of what I mean. So here is a very simple design. You don't have to be a mechanical or a civil or a structural engineer to understand this. Here is a small beam or a bar. Let's say it's a beam to be technical. And then I'm applying a load at the end and it's fixed on the wall. Somewhere on the wall it's fixed, okay? Now there are two variables here, diameter and height. Diameter and length, sorry. Diameter, it's a circular cross section diameter and the length is the length of the beam. So one thing I'm going to design this beam for is the weight. I want to have minimum weight because that's going to cost me the minimum. So basically I'm minimizing cost. That's my first objective. As soon as I do that, I'm going to get a beam that will be so thin in terms of its diameter, so small diameter and so small length that the end point due to the load, the end point is going to deflect quite a bit. That may foul with something. So I say, okay, I'm also interested in designing the same beam for which the end deflection is minimum. So when you have these two things, you put as an objective. First objective is minimizing the weight. Second objective is, is, is minimizing the end deflection. I've got these formulas taken from the applied mechanics literature. The first objective is a function of D and L. As you can see, it's the weight. Second objective comes from the literature that says how much it deflects when you apply a load P. All right? And I have some constraints that says the maximum stress developed in the beam should not be more than its, its stress carrying capacity. And also, the deflection should be limited to certain value. Okay, so there are two constraints, two objectives, and two variables in this problem. So I'm trying to understand first that what is this problem? Where are the optimal solutions when I have uh, more than one objective? So let's take this as an example problem, okay? So what I've done here at the bottom is I have considered, there are two variables so I can show you the design space. So x-axis on the left, left plot is the D, and the y-axis is the length, L. And there are these variable bounds. D goes between some value to some value, and H length goes between some value to some value. Okay, so you can see that. Every point inside that, that rectangle is a DL combination that I'm interested in. But now when I put this DL into my stress constraints, the two stress constraints that I have, the sigma max less than or equal to SY, and the deflection delta should be less than some allowable delta max, when I have that, this white region that you see, uh, they are invisible. That DL combination makes one of those, at least one of those constraints not satisfied. So that means the less than equal to sign is not satisfied. So that means I cannot recommend those D and L. Some of the things get violated. And all those points that are satisfying both the constraints are shown with, with, with the black dot. So all this black dots area is feasible. Now the question is, which one of them are optimal? Right? That's the question. So for that, what I do, I draw, I draw the second picture on the right, which is now drawn on the two objective space, F1 and F2. On the x-axis, I've got F1, which is the weight of the beam, and on the y-axis, I've got the deflection, which is my second objective. So this, this plane that I'm doing this for is called the objective space, and the, the left side space is called the decision variable space. Okay? So these are the two spaces. Now what I've done is, each of these black dots from the left plot, which gives me a D and L combination, I compute F1, F2, and I show that point on the objective space. So the right-hand plot has come from the left-hand plot. Every of these points, when I compute F1, F2, I show it there, right? So you can see that it's a different looking shape, right? It depends on the objective functions that you have. Now, this can tell us now what points are optimum. Now, since I'm minimizing the F1, the x-axis, and maximizing the y-axis, sorry, also minimizing the y-axis, it's the lower bottom, is the bottom left part of these objective space becomes an optimal, which I'm going to show you with the definition a little later. But what happens is, this part that I've shown you with the red line, you see, these are, this is the Pareto optimal set, because 
you cannot have anything better than that line when you're interested in both objectives. That comes as the edge of this surface. Now if I go and see where are these points coming from in the decision variable space, you see this horizontal line that I have at the, at the DL space coming at the bottom? That's what it's coming from. So now you see the difference between the single objective and two objectives. First of all, there are more than one solution that's optimum in this case. Secondly, since there are many optimal solutions now, I can look at them in the decision space and look for some kind of pattern, look for, look for some kind of uniformity or some unified concepts that they may have or not. So what I observe here is that all these points in the decision space that are coming, for, coming as an optimal has one thing fixed, and that is the length of the beam is exactly 200 millimeter, is exactly at the lower bound. So what this exercise after finding the optimal solutions, so we are getting these optimal solutions, but additionally, it's giving me this information that says, you should have your length of the beam at the lower bound fixed in order to be an optimum. So these kinds of studies can provide you recipes, provide you really good information of how to create an optimal solution. These are very vital information. I'll spend a little more time about it. This is what I mean as knowledge creation, okay? It can come as a byproduct of this. But I hope at this point you get this idea of what I mean by optimality in the concept of more than one objective and there's these two spaces that we have. One is the objective space and one is the, uh, the, the decision space. The optimal solution in the decision space are called Pareto optimal solutions and the corresponding solutions in the objective space are called efficient solutions. These are different names, efficient or non-inferior solutions and the solutions in the, in the decision variable space are called Pareto optimal solutions. Okay, this is a loose definition I gave you. When you have the picture, I can tell you which points are parry to optimal or not. But there are very rigorous mathematical definitions of these points uh, which exist in the literature. I'm not giving you the, the, that very rigorous definition but saying you in words what's happening. It says a solution X star which belongs to the set of feasible solutions, capital X, is parry to optimal if there is no, I'm stressing the word no here, there, there is no other solution in the feasible space such that the, the, the function vector, the objective vector at this current point x minus the objective vector at this optimal point x star belongs to the third quadrant. That means, actually this is a mathematical concept, but what it means is that there does not exist any other point x which is better with respect to the x star in all objectives. So that's the definition of a parity optimal set. So what you can do is, if you are trying to suspect whether a point is parity to optimal or not in two objectives where you're minimizing both, you take, a plain, you take a plain paper and put the top right corner, like I'm showing you with the yellow shedding, shaded region here, as if that's a paper, piece of paper, you take the top right corner to the point X star you're suspecting whether it's parity to optimal or not. If there does not exist any point in that paper, it's a parity to optimal point. So you see in this particular case, I have no solutions because all the solutions are marked with this uh, weird shaped region, right? All solutions are there. There doesn't exist anything outside this. So since X star is such a point that if I take the paper, put its top, top right corner to that point, I don't have anything on the play paper, that means it's a parity problem. So this is a way taking a math and trying to explain to you what's, what's causes a point to be parity optimal. In the evolutionary literature, we define it slightly differently. Uh, well, rather, we give a different name. We call it a domination. So X1 mathematically dominates another solution X2 if both these conditions are true, that X1 is not worse than X2 in all objectives, and X1 is strictly better than X2 in at least one of the objectives. So if you can check this on a computer very nicely with this, and that will define you what is meant by a, a, a dominated solution. One solution dominates the other. A, dom, a solution dominating the other actually is better, right? So if I have a set of population members, like I'm showing you here with six members, on a problem where I am maximizing F1 and minimizing F2, Let's say I've got a situation like that. I'm maximizing F1, minimizing F F2, and I've got these six solutions, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, now what I can do is compare one with the other to find out which points are not dominated by any other member in the population. What you will observe is this point three, five, and six. 
which I've joined with a red line, these three points do not dominate. I'm sorry, do not get dominated by any other member. But solution one, for example, gets dominated by solution three. Solution two will get dominated by solution four. And so similarly, solution four will get dominated by solution five. But nobody dominates three, five, and six. In the context of the paper analogy I gave, here you have to put the left top corner because you are maximizing F1 and minimizing F2. So if you put a top left corner of a paper on each of these points, you will see that in their image uh, on the paper, there doesn't exist any point. Um, if you put it on three, again, if you put it on five, and again, if you put it on six. But if you put it on one, you will have three coming on it. And that means three dominates one. So I mean, that's the concept. So, so given a population of these six points, I'm actually able to identify these three non-dominated points very quickly. How quickly? If you have n points, there are computer algorithms exist that can do it in n log n uh, kind of complexity wise. If you have two or three objectives, if you have four objectives or more, it gets a little more uh, heavy, but not a whole lot. Actually, log n has a power uh, m minus 3. So it just gets, it starts to m minus 2, I think. It just gets, uh, gets a, another log n time uh, when you introduce one more objective. So it's not a whole lot. You can very quickly identify this set, which is non-dominated in your population of size n. So ideally speaking, if you extend this and say that n is my all possible feasible solutions in the search space, if they're finite, if you apply this principle, what you'll end up getting is a Pareto optimal set. But that, of course, I don't recommend you because that's almost like an exhaustive search. It's more than exhaustive search. So I don't recommend you that. Uh, but that's one way to understand what is a Pareto optimal set. All right. So um, there are a couple of differences, main differences with the single objective optimization. On the left side, I'm showing you a typical single objective optimization scenario when you have an objective function, which is shown as a surface, and you have a decision space where you are searching, right? Your algorithm is searching. All you are trying to find is which point in that search space has the minimum height to the surface. That's what you're trying to find. And in multi-objective, you have two spaces. One is the decision space, and the other is the objective space. And you're trying to then figure out which are parity to optimal. Second uh, difference is that in the case of single objective, usually you end up getting one solution. Unless it's a multimodal problem, you end up with one solution. In the case of multi-objectives, you end up with number of solutions. And these are the trade-off solutions, right? So you could do this knowledge creation and other stuff when you have multiple solutions uh, that is your target. So let's first look at, again, what are some usual way, classical ways of solving it, and then we'll move toward this evolutionary method. All right, so the main uh, way these problems are solved using classical methods is this principle here in this slide. You have a multi-objective problem that I'm showing on the leftmost block. First thing you do is think of a higher level decision-making function, some kind of utility function or some scalarization function, which will convert multiple objectives into a single objective. So one of the things I already highlighted you could do is have a weighted sum. So you've got, you have to optimize five functions, OK? You just make w1, f1 plus w2, f2 plus w3, f3, like that. And you choose some w vector, which is in proportion to how much importance each of these objectives is to you. And then you optimize that single objective in that vertical uh, step. And this idea, when you do that, is guaranteed to give you one parity optimal solution. It's guaranteed. There, if, if the optimization is perfect. It's guaranteed to give you a parity optimal solutions. Then if you want to get an idea of what are the other parity optimal solutions, what you could do is you can repeat that process by changing the Ws. So this is the typical way they would convert to a single objective problem and solve repeatedly by using different weights. Okay? So let's take, for example, this concept for a two objective problem. I have F1 and F2, only two objectives. What I have done is I have, I have uh, come up with a, a composite function or an aggregate function that says w1 f1 plus w2 f2. And I choose some w and w2. Like if I choose 0.5 for w1 and 0.5 for w2, then what it says is that I made a linear combination of the two objectives. So what I'm getting is a contour, which is a straight line, which slope is going to be 45 degrees. If I change my w and w2, I'll have a different slope. And then when I'm minimizing this composite function, Essentially, what I'm doing is dragging that line all the way down as much as possible towards the origin, 
But obviously, I cannot get to the origin in this case because there is no feasible solution if I get there. So your optimal solution to this place would be the point that is tangent to your Pareto optimal set. So Pareto optimal set is that red line again, as you see in the bottom left corner, right? And this line is tangent at the point A. So if you apply the optimization algorithm, you are going to get the point A. So if you want a point B or any other point on that, all you have to do is change your slope and then it's going to rerun, and then it's going to give you another point. So this is how you can generate this Pareto optimal point. Actually, this method of generating different Pareto optimal solutions with every time with a different optimization run is called a generative method. But this method has a problem. Take, for example, a multi-objective, two-objective problem which, which generates into this kind of shape, which is called a non-convex, having a non-convex Pareto front. If my, if my objective space becomes this shaped, my Pareto front is where? My Pareto front is still going from A to D. The whole boundary is still my Pareto front. But you apply the weighted sum, you will see that you will not be able to get a point between B and C. This non-convex part of the front, you will not be able to create or generate by the weighted sum principle. Because no point there becomes the tangent of any straight line, that's the last one. So for, if you took any, two, any point there, apparently there is a line that is tangent there, but that's not the last line because you could take it further down towards the origin to get other points. So you will never end up getting a point. So if you are using the weighted sum approach to such a problem, you will have a huge gap. You will get from A to B and then from C to D. You will not be able to create between B to C. So that's a problem that's been well known in the literature. But there is a solution. People have come up with this method called epsilon constraint method. What you do there is instead of using weighted sum, you scalarize it in a different way. So out of all the objectives, you choose one of them and keep that as an objective. Rest all of them, you now put a constraint. So here, for example, I'm minimizing F2 and putting a constraint on F1, saying F1 should be less than epsilon 1. So now you see, instead of the whole objective space being feasible, I have only the left part before the left side of epsilon, epsilon 1, in this case that I'm putting, is feasible. When I'm putting epsilon 1 there, okay? So, and now when I minimize F2, I can generate a point like C, which was not possible to obtain by the weighted sum method. So just by changing the epsilon 1, uh, going between the lower and the upper bound on F1, I can actually generate all these different points. I could do the same thing on F2 as well. So this is called the epsilon constraint method. Idea remains the same. It's just that you convert it, convert the multi-objective problem in a different way as a new single objective problem. It's a parametric transformation and you change a parameter. Uh, in case of the weighted sum, your parameters are weights. In case of epsilon constraints, your parameters are epsilon. But this algorithm is slightly better than the weighted sum approach because this algorithm has two kinds of proof. One is no matter what epsilon you choose, as long as they're positive, they're within the, within the lower and upper bound, it's going to create a Pareto optimal point. And every Pareto optimal point can be found from an epsilon vector. But uh, the weighted sum did not have the second, second proof that every Pareto optimal point cannot be obtained from any weight vector. So there are some points which will not be able to get from the weighted sum. So this is a little better. It has proofs on both ways. So that's why this method is quite popular, and people have also improved on this. They call a new method is called um, normal constraint method. The constraint comes in a slightly different way in an angular manner, and that's really a popular uh, method that they use. No matter what method you, you pick from the classical MCDM literature, the multi-criteria decision-making literature, they have some of these difficulties. One is they need to be run they need to run a single objective method many times, as I showed you, with different Ws or different epsilons. Um, knowledge of these Ws and epsilon is absolutely essential, okay? Because you can use different arbitrary epsilons. Some of the time, they will not create a feasible solution. Some of the times, different epsilon is going to create the same solution. So it's a waste of computation if you do that. I think the problem is, with this method, is that multi-objective optimization is treated as a special case of single objective. You take any optimization book, okay? Um, if there are 10 chapters, I mean, including my first book where I also wrote an optimization book, all the, the first initial chapters 
were talking about how to solve single objective problems. At the end, they would have a separate chapter or a section on multi-objective optimization, and then they will say, okay, let's try to make a scalarized version, a single objective version of this multi-objective, and all these algorithms that we talked in the first nine chapters can be used to solve it. So they are treating multi-objective as a special case of single objective. Right when I started looking at these problems, this was a problem to me because coming with a computing, computing background, we cannot take this as a generic idea. Uh, let, let me give you this example. I mean, very simple example. Um, in a computing course, if you are asked to write a code, a computer code, that will add, let's say, n, n numbers. It's going to add. Write a code and submit it as an assignment. What you are going to do? So you don't know how many numbers the person is going to add. So you'll make a very generic purpose code. So first thing you are going to ask is, OK, how many numbers are you going to add? Or have some facility by which if the person puts a 0, that means that's the end of the thing. Something you do, right? And then you go into a loop saying, OK, as the numbers are coming in, you are adding, you are adding the result, adding with the previous additions, and you're keeping on. And at the end, come out of the loop and, and presents the result. Right? That will be a very generic purpose code where multiple numbers can be added together. But now, I want to test it, how you have written the code. When you give me the, the code, I put, when you ask me how many numbers you want to add, I put one. Then what your code supposed to do? So you're trying to add one number. That means what? You're not adding anything. Or your code should do what then? Your code, instead of hanging or getting stuck, this should get you give the code, give the result back like the one number that you have given, right? Because there's nothing to add, so you gave one number, you have that. So your code should work. So that's the concept here. If you have a multi-objective problem, that should be a generic purpose algorithm. Now, when, when you have a code that is multi-objective, if I go there and try to solve single objective, it should ask me in the beginning, how many objectives are, do you have? I say one. Then the whole algorithm should degenerate into a single objective optimization code. Unfortunately, that's not how it is in optimization literature. All the emphasis is on solving single objective. If you have a multi-objective, then they will ask you more questions. Oh, you want to solve more than one objective? I'm in trouble. Can you give me some weights? Can you give me some epsilons so I can add them? So it'll ask you more and more questions if you want to solve multi-objective. That's not the computing philosophy. That's really anti-computing philosophy. All you are trying to do in evolutionary way of doing it is getting it back to like a computing method. Okay, so that a multi-objective optimizer is a generic purpose code. When you give a single objective, it becomes a special case. Just the opposite of what it is now. The other difficulty with this kind of generative approach is this the plot, plot that I have at the bottom of this slide. Um, let's say you have scalarized it, and one of the points on the Pareto front is your target for this run. And you're starting with the initial point, and your algorithm is working with iterations, and eventually comes close to that Pareto point, right? On that process, it is probably have skipped some local optima, it has skipped some infeasible regions, it has done all this hardship and eventually came and gave you the optima. Now you've terminated the run. Now you want to find another point, right? So you change your scalarization method, you change your weights, you change your epsilon. Now another point is your target. This algorithm has to relearn the whole thing, how to solve the problem all over again, because your previous run is completely gone, out of the memory now. So there is no parallel effect that you get in getting one point from the other. Instead, if you had a population approach where all population members are approaching the Pareto front, you could actually gain from one another, and you can have a parallel algorithm. So these are the two ways you can actually gain if you consider it's like a, like a population approach. So here is some results from this normal constraint method that I mentioned is a very good algorithm with the classical, but it finds one point at a time. I'm showing you results on three problems here. The top problem there, top right, is a two objective problem, and I'm showing you F1 on X axis, F2 on Y axis, and after 20,000 evaluations, how the points are kind of lined up on the, on the Pareto front, and the vertical line you see are called weak Pareto points. These are unwanted points, but this algorithm finds them anyway. So that's a waste of effort, but it finds it. But you see nice distribution. Uh, the second problem has lots of local Pareto, point, Pareto optimal fronts where it can get stuck. 
And this algorithm got stuck far away. You can see when I say global Pareto optimal front, that's really the front I wanted to go. That's really the best front. But this algorithm gets stuck in one of the local Pareto front after 100,000 function evaluations. Then on the left, it's a three objective problem. In case of three objectives, now you have a Pareto surface instead of a line. So F1, F2, F3. Now you see this set of points I terminated after 100,000 function evaluations. And some of them have reached the Pareto front, but most of them have not. So that's the situation. If I run longer, this, all these points will go. I will come back to these three problems a little later. So that was the situation back in early 90s. And I just wanted to give you, this was uh, something I got carried away and putting you some historical perspective on when these things have started. Uh, this was the formal end of Cold War, okay, between US and USSR. Mandela Clinton become presidents. Can you remember those days? Some of you probably were not born, but many of you were, I guess. Um, and then uh, Will Morton Campbell came up with the world's first cloned sheep. Okay, that was a big, great news at that time. Uh, in terms of GA and the, all this field that it has grown, there was a merger. We had a merger between all these different fields. There was a big event in GA community, and the Gecko conferences were about to start and all that. Dave Goldberg, around that, that time on his book, was published in 89, and he suggested a 10-line sketch of what could be a very good multi-objective algorithm. But he did not prove it. He did not do any simulation or anything, but he just suggested. So these were the situations we had, and this was the beginning of this whole thing. Then people thought, OK, we have a population approach. We have these multimodal problem-solving uh, algorithms that can find multiple optimal solutions, not for multi-objective, but for single objective, like I showed you at the end of my last lecture. There are a number of optima you can find. So we already had ways of implementing niching, like sharing function or other, other ways, in order to find multiple optimal solutions. And genetic algorithms are implicitly parallel. So we thought we could really combine these whole ideas, and then we can get a very good algorithm. So that was really the beginning. And the idea then of EMO was this. Instead of asking the, the users what weights, what epsilons that you have to put, you don't ask anything. Just take the problem, solve it, and find a set of Pareto optimal solutions, like I'm showing you here. Send a, find a representative set of points. Now you go to the decision maker and say, these are the solutions we have found. Which one would you like? Can you compare and choose one from it? That's a much better approach than asking for information without finding any solutions. This is how the, for example, the automobile manufacturer, all the consumer goods manufacturer are doing. You take, for example, I don't know which car is most popular here, but take a, take a GM car, for example. Go to a GM workshop, uh, sh shop, you know, and then you will see maybe there are 10 different models that are lined up. One, and, and the price for each of them is marked on them. And from the literature, by, look, by looking at the car magazines, people's views, you know how they perform. So you have all this information. You are the decision maker then. You are going there and picking one car from there. So that means this is the principle you're following, that somebody has optimized and find a number of different solutions for this trade-off of between different goals that you may be considering. As a decision maker, you are going out there and picking one car from it. So that's the philosophy we want to just say for every multi-objective problem, let's do it the same way. It turns out that when you have two, three objectives, uh, something happened. Do you see that over there? But this one I don't see. Can, uh, the, the TV here is not, uh, because I'm looking at it to progress. So. OK, maybe they will fix it by the time. So, um, so you see this diagonal line I'm putting. Uh, so this diagonal line is getting to be what is recent, is that you don't want to, so particularly when you have a large number of objectives, it becomes difficult to really find the whole set of Pareto points and then make a decision. We are finding some shortcuts by which you're making decisions and optimization simultaneously. So I'll come back to that a little later. All right, so if you're believing in this concept of evolutionary way of doing it, that means first find a set of points and then make a decision, you have to do two things in your evolutionary algorithm. First is, you should be able to converse to the Pareto front, okay? Now, look at these yellow dots of points. So, if it's a two-objective problem, and I'm finding and showing you these yellow dots of points, 
I, I see a nice spread of solutions, but none of them is Pareto optimal, right? So none of them is really useful to me because they are not even close to being optimum, any of them. So they're not useful to me. On the other hand, if you look at the other set of yellow points where all converge to the Pareto front, but only on one end of the Pareto front, again, I'm not giving you an idea of the entire Pareto front. So neither of these two yellow dots of points are what I want. I really want these black dots of points where they're all converged to the Pareto front and there's a nice distribution. So I'm seeing different trade-offs. Okay, so in single objective optimization, we are always concentrating on converging to the optimal solutions. We never cared about diversity, okay, how good a diversity we get. But in multi-objective for the first time, we need to have both convergence and diversity as a focus in our algorithm. Because these are not going to happen automatically. You have to do something for it. Here is again a very short history, brief history of how these things have happened. I mentioned to you about the time when this has happened, but you see this picture of uh, uh, Dave Schaefer uh, along the line of Vega, 1984. He was the first person uh, from Vanderbilt University. Okay, thanks, I have that now. Uh, Vanderbilt University in 1984, he suggested this algorithm called Vector Evaluated GA or Vega. Unfortunately, his, his thesis was showing negative results. That means he did a lot of things and at the end it showed evolutionary methods are not able to maintain uh, a good set of diverse points on the Pareto front. I think that is probably one of the reasons that not many people had looked into this field for long, long years. Then in Goldberg in 89, first thought of these ways of uh, doing these, these uh, multi-objective optimization. And these three groups of researchers, um, Fonseca is on the leftmost side. Uh, he, he's from Portugal, but he did his PhD in Sheffield university where he suggested this method called MOGA, multi-objective GA. In the middle is Jeff Horn, uh, who with Goldberg suggested this idea called NPGA, niche parito GA. And the right side is me when we started working in, in, in India on uh, NSGA, non-dominated searching GA, almost at the same time. Each of these three groups in different continents had picked up Goldberg's idea and implemented in a different way. Of course, there are some more things needed to be done just uh, beyond the 10 line sketch. But during this period of 93, 95, when algorithms came out, and that actually showed the world that yes, evolutionary method can be used to reliably converse to the Pareto front and find a wide distributed set of points. Uh, I can tell you with my experience, we published this. Um, yeah, actually, I, I published this paper in Evolutionary Computation Journal. That is one of our flagship journal in this area. Paper appeared in 95 in the beginning. And then 96, I was visiting in Brazil the first time, uh, well, in the summer after I went back to India. And I was visiting one of the CNPq labs in Rio. And my first day, I was going to, my host was taking me towards his office. And I see from the other side, the editor-in-chief of the Evolutionary Computation Journal walking. And I was surprised, he's from US. I see him there because there was a conference. He came, I also came. I shook hands with him. And this was about one and a half year after our paper was published, right? And he's dealing with lots of papers every month. First thing he told me, that was a nice paper. Uh, that really struck me in my head is that this guy is looking so many papers. He kind of single-handedly, after seeing me so many years later, recognize that I published a paper. You know, so that told me that probably there's something here, okay? After that, I started getting so many invitations to talk about this, how do we do this, how do we solve different problems for multi-objective, there was no looking back really after that. So, so there were some early indications, there was need that these algorithms need to be developed, but when the algorithms came out, the ideas came out, really people took to take, take charge of these. So I start my era one now, where all these methods, different people have developed at one common thing. None of them had any elite preservation operation. That means the best solutions from previous generations, previous iterations, were not passed on, okay? It was completely generative kind of methods. All these algorithms that I'm showing you there. But um, if you look at some of these on the, on the yellow um, that I'm highlighting, particularly the MOGA by Fonseca, and Fleming and, and Srinivas and myself with the NSGA and the Niche Parito GA by Horn, Goldberg. Um, look at the citations now. This I've updated this morning again, looking at the Google Scholar. 
uh, look at the citations. I mean, they're about uh, 20 years old, right? 20 years old. Uh, but the citations for each of them is really, really quite high. Uh, then there are other methods. I didn't write down the citations. Um, they may not be in four figures, four figures, but they're definitely in three figures. So what do you have to do to have this idea work? Well, you have this overall evolutionary algorithm I showed you in the previous lecture. All you have to do now is how do you assign a fitness to an individual? Every population member has now a vector of numbers, different objective values. How do you assign uh, one fitness value? That's where you have to bring in these two concepts. A, me a measure that will say how good you are in terms of convergence, a measure that will say how good you are in terms of diversity. As long as you can do that, you have your own EMO algorithm, evolutionary multi-objective algorithm. And that's how lots of people are coming into the field with these very basic guidelines. They are developing their own methodologies, right? So there are two things you need to do. Of course, we know which points to, to emphasize in order to go towards the Pareto front. It's the non-dominated solutions, the solutions that do not get dominated by any other member. Also, to maintain diversity, you need to emphasize less crowded solutions. Now, that's where the problem is. Because there are two spaces I talked about, right? One is the decision space, the other is the objective space. Now, less crowded, which space are you talking about? If you talk about less crowding in the decision space, then on the leftmost figure, the two isolated points you see, those are your points that you should emphasize. You should give more than one copy in your mating pool, right? On the other hand, in the objective space, diversity, if you're looking for, those two isolated points you should, you should emphasize. But not necessarily these two points in the objective space are coming from those two isolated points in the decision space. They may not be. So you need to first be very clear of what space you're looking your diversity to be, and then you introduce the, the crowding in that space, okay? Um, first results from NSGA shows that on very simple problems, the first one is your starting set of points, and the second one is actually showing after 100 generations where the population are. As you can see that, all the populations came converged to the Pareto Optimal Front, but this was the early results on NSGA. There was a very nice apl application by a UIUC professor using this NSGA concept. Um, they worked with NASA's uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, in trying to identify or find spacecraft trajectories going from Earth to some other planet. At that point of time, going to Mars was a big thing. Jupiter was already there, but, th but these, these people were helping. So here, they were thinking of two objectives. One is, you want to get from Earth to Mars in a minimum amount of time. So time of flight is to be minimized. Second is, you want to reach there with maximum payload. So you can take more equipment, more people, rather than more fuel. That's the idea, okay? Turns out that they are in conflict. If you want to go there quickly, you have to take more fuel. But if you can give time, you can take less fuel and more people. That's the trade-off, right? So they want to quantify it, so they had models and all that working with NASA, and they found out this Pareto front based on our NSGA code, because there's no other thing available except NPGA and MOGA, but they chose to use NSGA. So I collaborated with them a little bit. So here is this Pareto front that they have found. Okay, you can see these. You're maximizing the y-axis and minimizing the x-axis. Okay, so let's take the minimum time solution. That is the leftmost solution. I call that number, solution number 44, is it? Yeah. So that's in, that, in the square grid, it is the left top solution, okay? So that takes about more than a year to get from Earth to Mars, and you can take about um, 700 kilos of mass over, to, over there. Let's go to the second trade-off solutions which is solution number, I can't read it here, but it's 73 or something like that, I think. 74 or something. So it's the, um, it's the one bottom to that, okay? On the grid, or the bottom one. So that takes one more year from the minimum, minimum time solution, but now you can take about 160 kilos more. So maybe one person, one equipment, you can take extra if you wait one more year. Okay, so that's a good trade-off, right? You reach in one year, but take only 650 kilos or 700 kilos. If you wait one more year, you can take 760, sorry, 160 kilo more. So that's the trade-off you have to make. And I'm giving you here not only that, but many other solutions. If you wait six months, there is another solution. If you wait three months, there is another solution, right? All these solutions are there. 
But now let's go to the other extreme, which is 74, I think. It's the top right solution you see there. That's one year more from the previous solution. So it takes three years to get there. But from the 72 solution, this is only five, sorry, two kilos more. So the difference, between, there is a slope, but difference in the y-axis is two kilos. So that I can even say, don't choose that solution because it's not worth waiting one more year to be able to take just two kilos more. But my question to you is this. If, I, if you did not find this peritofron, did not know this unequal trade-offs that you have on your peritofron, the whole thing is the peritofron. If you had used epsilon constraint or any other method, you could have converged somewhere between 72 and 73, and that's the only solution you would have had, and you would have gone home saying, ah, I've done a good decision, but only this tells, no, you've not done a good decision. 73, the left, more, left solution is much better than the 74. Actually, the trade-off really happens at this range. So ideally, you should choose one solution from this most trade-off area, not anywhere else. So unless you find the Pareto front, there is no way for you to know where to, make your, where to choose your solution, where to put your solution. These kinds of examples came out in that era one quite a bit in industry and practical problems. This actually showed people that, yeah, there is a need. We need to be more informed. We need to know what's happening. What are the different trade-off solutions? Then they look for methodologies and they find, oh, the only thing to do is emo there, evolutionary way of doing it. That's why we have so many citations. That's why this field has grown so much. Even after 20 years, it's, it's really one of the most active areas in the whole gamut of evolutionary computation. Right? Okay. Now, this is the basics. Now let's go over and then what has happened during that time. I'm just trying to give you a historical perspective in this lecture. Um, I realize that um, as this field is growing, applications will come, this will bolster what you are doing, but many people out there are going to do their thesis. Many professors are going to write papers, right? They will come up with new algorithms. They need some problems to test. They need some ways to evaluate their methods. So this is something I thought very early, back in 2000, actually 99, I started working on this. So I systematically developed and suggested some test suit, a set of six test problems called, later on was known as ZDT problems. Um, these problems allow you to systematically test your algorithm. Very simple ideas were there, but ZDT1, ZDT2, 236, uh, again, because of time, I'm not going to go into the details, but it, these are two objective problems where it introduces difficulty, for example, of converging to the Pareto front. So we make some problems hard so that your algorithm will have difficulty converging there. Can you beat that? Can you have some features in your method that will not get stuck, okay? Another set of problems we had were convex front versus concave front. Can you work with all these? Because classical methods have difficulty. We have Pareto fronts that are disjointed. The one on the top, as you see, they're disjointed Pareto fronts. One at the bottom, I showed you already, it has lots of local Pareto fronts where you can get stuck. So these are, some of them are very difficult problems. Some of them are simple problems. So you, if your algorithm is solving all these problems nicely compared to the current state of the art, you've got a good idea. You've got a good method. Even now, you can use these test problems to, to check your ideas. Okay? Uh, so that came out. And then, of course, once you have test problems, once you made algorithms to evaluate, you need a performance measure. How do you evaluate? Because now I have multiple target, right? So you need a metric that's going to take a vector of solutions, number of solutions, and come up with one performance measure. It turns out you cannot have one performance measure. In fact, there are some authors who have worked on, they said, if you have M objectives, you need at least M measures for you to say whether algorithm A is better than algorithm B or not. I came out and say, okay, theoretically that's correct, but we could probably do with two. One it says how well you have conversed to the Pareto front, the other says how well you have diversified. The diversification metric will be a little fuzzy, but you can do. You can just come up with something, and that's what we had proposed, few, few, few performance measures. Uh, so here in these slides, I'm trying to show them some of those. So the main achievements of that era, I'm talking about 90s beginning to the end of 2000 was that few algorithms were suggested, but all of them had some parameters in them, and they were non-elitist, mostly. Test problems were suggested. Basic performance metrics were suggested, so you can start doing some work. That really revolutionized the whole thing. 
shortcomings of that era was that the elite preservation was missing. And these parameterized algorithms, uh, so you need to always, always use a parameter to run your algorithm, so that was a difficult thing. So we tried to take, get rid of that parameter. So that started in era two. Again, there are quite a few algorithms came out in 2000 to about 2006, 7. A lot of algorithms came out. I'm highlighting a couple of them here because they are still in use, still very popular. So we had the strength Pareto EA, SPA2, look at the citations of that. And the non-dominated sorting GA2, which is the elitist version of NSGA. So we took out the parameter that we had, and it's a very modular algorithm. Look at the citations count there, 12,000. Okay, till I, I updated it this morning. So um, it's, it's really, I mean, every time I go to a conference, and that's happening now almost once every month, I update this and I get surprised how fast these things are changing. So it's, it's really amazing that so many people are using this. There are some software companies who are totally surviving on some of these methods. So just to impress you that these are really happening, happening field. A lot of things are happening if you're interested in this multi-objective optimization. So what is NSGA2? Um, it's modular. It's very modular. There is no parameter. Of course, you have population size, crossover probability. Those are the standard GA or EA parameters. There is no extra parameter for doing multi-objective optimization, and it's fast. A um, lot of commercial softwares come in. At least the first one, the Mode Frontier from Estico, um, and the Red Cedar one that I'm going to show you later, they are really surviving on NSGA2. I, I mean, um, without those, those algorithms, are, those softwares are not being bought. I mean. I'm closely associated with at least one of them, and I know the statistics. This, this algorithm got lots of awards because of its fast uh, uh, use and, and, and kind of proliferation. So anyway, again, the video is not working today. So what you would have observed is when I run NSGA2 on this set of initial points, they will all go as a front with iterations and eventually converge to that line, which is the Pareto optimal front. But that's the only thing you're missing today but um, believe me, this works, okay? Um, all right, I'm getting back to those three problems I showed you with NCM, the normal constraint method. The same problems, I'm using NSGA2 without anything, any change between one problem to the other. Same algorithm applied to these three different problems with same population size, all parameters being same. This was the first problem where they had those extra points they found, NSGA2 doesn't find them. But look at how good a distribution it gets with the same number of function evaluations. This was what they had before. Now, this was what they had with NCM, and this is what NSGA2 does. It gets back to that global Pareto front because of the global perspective that evolutionary method has. This is what they had, remember, and this is what we get. All the points converge to the Pareto front. It doesn't look like a very good distribution because I could see some holes here and there. I will show you some results on the same problem using NSGA3, which has just appeared in last month's TEC. It's in August uh, 2014. And I've got some results on the same problem, the three objective problem, and you'll see how good a distribution it gets to. Uh, you could again do similar concepts. I skipped the constraint handling part in single objective also. Here also I'm going to skip, but you could do very simply so small change in the definition of domination, and you can make it to work when you have constraints. So I'm skipping that, also the video. Uh, these things have been applied to lots of problems like the single objective. Uh, I have been consultant on few industries. This is one I'm still, going, still doing. It's a mind scheduler from Australia. Uh, they're doing so successfully. I mean, these, so, so it's a mine area that you've got, and you know there are some ores in the ground and you need to get those, right? So there are three objectives I'm showing here, but we actually had a four objective version of that also. And so what they do is this whole region, they, they split into small, small blocks, three-dimensional three blocks. And the number of blocks in a mine area can go to more than a million. They have, I think the highest they have solved is about five million blocks. So you have a problem with five million blocks, and now you have to schedule those blocks, that means at the first day of the mining operation, which blocks are to be mined? Then which block? Then which block? Every day. So usually the mines operate for three years, four years, five years, depends on how big it is. So you need to make the schedule today for the next five years. Which are the blocks? There are a lot of constraints because you cannot take a block from below unless you have removed the block from top, right? So these are things. If you have only one block left, 
and everywhere you have already dug in, you cannot put your equipment. So all these are constraints. But the other practical constraint that comes in is from the mine operators, uh, mine owners. They say that I cannot wait for your schedule to give me the first profit, first money that I will get after six months or so. Because most mine, most mine operations do that. They first remove all the dirt, okay, and then you start getting some real ores that they can get money from. They said, no, right from the first month, I want to start earning money. So can you give me a schedule that will do that? So all this becomes your objectives. So the owner wants something, and the operation owner wants something else. Total amount of money you invest should be minimum. Uh, the ore quality that you get should be maximum. So all these different objectives come in, and you can easily get into four or five objectives here. So again, I had a video here, cannot show it. Uh, but what happened is, I mean, as I said, it's a happening place. Just before coming here, the day before, my people there, whom I'm corresponding with, this is called Evolution. Um, this has an evolution and ore uh, mining from it. Um, it's, it's a company called Orology in Australia. When I first started working with them, there are three people working from a garage. So I visited them, understood the problem, and then we were consulting. After six months, they had a product. They had 44 people. They moved to downtown Perth. Okay, uh, so they were eventually become the second largest company in the software area to help for mine scheduling. Just the day before I was coming here, they called me and said they have been bought up now by a much bigger giant in mining engine called MapTech. I'm, I'm putting their uh, thing there at the bottom. So they've just been bought. So, and, and this is not the first company that I helped or bought. Uh, there was another one also before. So it's a happening place because people are looking for methodologies which can really do large scale problems with multiple objectives and, and things can happen. So in that era, also, um, we developed some scalable test problems. I showed you two objective test problems, but then there was a need for solving many objective problems, like three objectives, four objectives, to 10 objectives, to 20 objectives, and like that. And so we developed some scalable test problems. Those are called DTLZ. Again, there are some principles that they go through. This is another vibrant area, that how can you design and come up with construct test problems that will, again, test algorithms ability to, to find and go to the Pareto front. So there are details at one to details at eight, different functions that we had. All right, again, along with that came performance measures. We needed to improve those. So this, this performance measure called hyper volume really came in that era, and that's like dominating now. It's a way you can measure both convergence and diversity into one metric, okay? Then there are other methods like attainment surface methods and all that. A lot of theoretical development has taken place. There are algorithms that came out with convergence proofs on certain type of problems. So mainly people from mathematics and theoretical computer science have spent time uh, developing those things and making proofs of those algorithms. Not for any arbitrary problem, but for certain types of problems. One thing that has happened is this what is called as multi-objectivization. This is becoming to be a new research trend in this area. Multi-objectivization, what does it mean? You may have a problem that is not a multi-objective problem. Okay, let's say a single objective constrained optimization problem. I'm just giving an example. But you throw in a helper objective, you throw in a second objective or a third objective or whatever, just to make it a multi-objective problem so that this emo concept can be used there. And we found that this always lead into a lot of beneficial results when you do that. It allows to maintain the diversity in your population. So although it's a single objective problem, you actually solve the problem much better than if you had solved it as a single objective problem. So this kind of multi-objectivization is really taking place. People are just becoming innovative of how to put the helper objective, what should be the helper objective. We've done some problems in constraint optimization, and um, bloating in GP is another problem, multimodal problem solving. So a particular one is what I call as innovation. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Okay, there is a book that came out. It talks about this multi-objectivization. So here are the constraint handling result. So when you have constraints, but you are dealing with a single objective problem, but constraints, one of the ways people solve in practice is a penalty function approach. What it is, uh, you have an, you create a penalty function that says, Objective function plus some penalty, okay? If a constraint is violated, you add a penalty, right? So what we do here is we have 
the first objective as my original objective function, the second objective is a constraint violation. So I throw in a second object. Instead of adding them together, I'm now saying constraint violation is a second objective I want to minimize. So when I do that, I get a nice Pareto front in a problem, but my target is not to find the whole Pareto front here, but to get to one part of the Pareto front, which is corresponding to the constrained optimum solution. So when we take this and use it with a hybrid way with a penalty function approach, um, I get these results. As you can see here, um, on the very last three columns, this is our method. And the other three studies were taken the best results that exist today on some standard test problems. So these standard test problems are solved by many algorithms. Ours is at the end. And what these numbers are showing here is the number of function evaluations needed to get the same accuracy. So you can compare other, any other methods with ours. Ours is almost an order of magnitude faster, smaller than the other methods. Because we are utilizing these concept of two objectives, it actually we are making it easier for problem to solve because diversity is maintained. The right kind of diversity is maintained. And we are hybridizing with a classical penalty approach. So we are taking advantage of both uh, evolutionary methods and classical methods in one, one algorithm. So that's really the benefit. That's what is called the multi-objectivization. Uh, bloating in GP. Those of you who work in genetic programming, uh, you know bloating is a huge problem. Bloating means the, the size of the program grows exponentially. So if you put size of the program as another objective that you want to minimize, in addition to the original objective, you have a much better control on your sizing and the, and the solution. Now I'm telling you a little bit about innovization. So that's again another multi-objectivization. We are kind of taking advantage of, of being multi-objective. So let's say that um, I'm working on a design problem. Okay, or it could be any optimization problem, but I'm doing it for at least two objectives. So here is a problem which I've taken from the literature of designing electrical uh, brushless uh, DC permanent magnet motor. So there was a two page long description of the objective function constraints, all these things. There are about 50 different variables. What I did is I wanted to make the problem simple. So I kept the formulation 45 variables I kept fixed, I kept only five of them changing, okay? There are two objectives. One is the um, cost of producing or, or, or fabricating that motor, and the second is the peak torque I want to maximize. So those of you who are into design, you know that if, if your cost is low, you are probably designing a motor with a smaller power. If the motor with a bigger power or larger power you want to design, you have to pay more because the motors will look big, right? So I use this as a two objective problem with this trade-off and you see that I, I got about 200 different motors in this Pareto front. So that's the Pareto front as you see, okay? Every dot there is a motor and it tells you how much it's going to cost and how much will be the corresponding peak torque. Okay, that's fine. That's the NSGA2's job. It can go and give you these Pareto points. Innovization starts now. What it does now, it looks at all these 200 high-performing designs, okay? Every one of them has five variables in them. That means you expect all the five variables are changing as you go from left to the right on this Pareto front, right? But what we observe is no. All these points, four of the five variables are exactly the same. Only way they're changing is by one of those variables, and that's what I'm showing here on the plot. It's the number of laminates. That is one of the variables in the optimization where the number of laminates can be a variable. The only way all these Pareto solutions are changing is in that variable. All other variables, including the number of turns of the wearing that is inside, is exactly the same. And I think that came out to be 18 turns as the optimum. So we allowed, uh, allowed uh, what, 10 to 80, I think, 10 to 80 different turns, and I think 18 turns came out to be common for all of them. So this can give you innovation. Now you are probably using a general purpose winding machine because one of the motors, if it's small, maybe it's using 10 turns, another one 20 turns, another 25. So you need a general purpose winding machine. This study shows no. All of them to be optimal, you got to have exactly 18. So now you can innovate and come up with a winding machine that will do exactly 18. That way you have good quality control. Less human error, operator error, okay? Another observation we had is all these solutions have gauge number 16 to wind. 
It's not, so they allowed 16 gauges, but only gauge number 16 turned out to be optimal. So this is just for this problem, but we tried this about 30, 40 different problems. Every time we come up with something that we didn't know before. And once you explain to this, to the designer, this says, yes, yeah, sure, why didn't I know it before? I mean, you know, so that kind of rules that these solutions are, are, are kind of containing, and what we are doing with this innovation process is revealing those, those information because these are the properties of the Pareto optimal solutions, high performing solutions, not any other. So if you, if you can discover what principles are common in these solutions, you are actually discovering rules that says if you have this in your design, you are a high performing optimal design. See how useful these kind of thing can be. So we tried this on a control problem. It's an it's a over, overhead crane maneuvering problem. So the idea here was the crane operator has to lift some load from a train and drop it to a truck so that it can go inland, right? So there are various things here. Operator's uh, salary depends on how many such droppings he's doing. Okay, so he wants to do this very quickly, okay? So he lifts it, he needs to now have a lot of plans. One is how fast he should go towards approaching the truck, because if he goes very fast, he's probably going to hit that other end, and that's going to cause a sway on the, on the pendulum here, and he has to wait before it slows down and then only he can drop it. So he's saving time there, but not in dropping. On the other hand, he could go very slow. So he's taking a lot of time going there without any sway. There may be something intermediate. That is what is the target, right? So what are these things? And obviously, these operations, time is important. So that's one of the objective. The second objective is the energy. Because he's paying his bill, right? He's taking these things, he has to pay energy to, just to bill, uh, pay this bill. So we want to minimize both time and energy, and it turns out they're in conflict. So what we had is a bang-bang force that you are applying to this uh, crane. So with time, how do you apply? Do you apply a force, energy, or not? Because once it's motion, you may not have to apply any energy. Because you keep on applying energy, it's going to go fast and hit there. On the other hand, how you are going to drop? These two are two independent things. So he has to control how the dropping is and where to apply the force. So these are our variables, and there's a two objective problem. So we have a lot of dynamics, as you can see. We formulated this like um, a dynamic system, and then we solve them, these ODEs, and at the end we get some results. Here is the Pareto front on blue, blue plot that you see, the whole Pareto front trade-off between time and energy. So there is a very small time solution, there is a very small energy solution. But what I'm showing you is not the Pareto front, okay? Now each of these Pareto solutions I can take and have a look at how the design is. That means how is the bang bang force la laid out and how do I drop it? Okay, let me go back because I need to tell you how I'm dropping. See that on the blue region here, I'm showing you different schemes of dropping. So from the left going towards the right, I need to go down there. Now I can either linearly go down, that means as I'm moving, I'm slowly dropping it. Or the top one says, I don't drop it, I drop it towards the end. I drop it only towards the end, suddenly. Or the other option could be, I drop it at the beginning and then slowly move there. Or something in between. So a lot of possibilities are there and I'm controlling any of these with single number called the exponent. These are exponential functions I'm putting. The exponent value tells me how I'm going to do this. Okay, so that's the only variable there. Now you look at these designs that I've got, okay? So the exponent is gamma. One thing you observe, the exponent I allowed to go between minus three to plus three. Minus three means first dropping and then going like that. Three means, no, drop it at the end. Zero means linear, okay? And then any real number can be in between, okay? Now one thing I observe, all these Pareto fronts seems to have gamma equal to almost three. That's my upper hand, upper bound, and everything going to be, the, every solution seems to follow this principle that you don't drop it at the beginning, you drop it as late as possible. And then you can also see how the bang bang force needs to be applied. Is initially you apply the bang force, later on you don't. That of course is understandable, right? You have to have the inertia, after the inertia is there, you leave it. But why is gamma have to be three? Although it could have been minus three to three. It's something that puzzled me for a while. Why is it coming out to be a recipe? to do for all these optimal solutions. If I pick a random solution from the search space, it doesn't have that. Gamma is anything between minus three and three, but all Pareto solutions have exactly three. If you look at this, what does three mean? Three means you drop it as late as possible. 
That means that's a strategy that says your pendulum length should be as small as possible for as long as possible. So why did this algorithm choose to have a smaller pendulum length while it's moving? Okay, a very simple calculation says that the energy that you need for the pendulum to move is mg L times cosine theta. Theta is the angle of movement. Assuming that's fixed and mass and the g is fixed, energy is proportional to L. So if you have a long length, you need more energy. If you have a small length, you need less energy. Because energy minimization is one of the objectives, the algorithm prefers to have with shorter length, which means not much of a drop in the beginning. Do it as late as possible. So now when I explain to you, and with the physics background, do you think, yeah, that makes sense, is it not? But if I had asked you that question instead of giving you the answer, many of you would have wondered that why is it so, and I wondered, uh, I actually had to talk to one of my physics colleagues and he just pointed to me and said, now that you tell me it makes sense because the length is smaller, a small length will have small energy. So it can bring out, this kind of analysis can bring out the essential part of how to solve the problem. Now if this information goes to the crane operator, see he's doing it with minimum energy and he's got a recipe now of how to do this, right? Okay, I got carried away with this idea. I've been doing it for the last three, four years now. A bit more, I think. Um, so I did this to uh, uh, choice of a team. So cricket is a game that in India people are crazy. I think like soccer here. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we are not very good in soccer, but cricket is, is number one in the world. But not many, not many countries play. But <laughs> whoever plays, uh, they do, the India does pretty well. So there is this lot of money involved in it. Uh, there is this new version which finish, gets finished in three hours. It's 2020 cricket, as they call it. So every year there is a league, like you have the leagues in uh, soccer leagues in UK and here and every places. There's a one in cricket. So um, there are some rules that you cannot have more than four foreign players. There are some parts of the game, some specialist players are needed. You can have only one of those. And lots of rules are there. So we followed all those rules. Those are our constraints. There are two aspects of this game. One is called the batting performance. The other is called the bowling performance. It's like the baseball. Uh, I don't know how many of you know cricket. It's a little complicated, but once you know the rules, it's a, it's a nice game. Um, there are two aspects of it, batting and bowling. So what I did is um, I collected the data from internet of all the current players. There are not all, 129 of them that are playing well. Their data is available. How are they, what is their score in the bowling compartment? What is their score in the batting compartment? So that's our starting point. And then we are forming a team of 11 players with all the restrictions that they have, okay? And I'm actually doing an NSGA2 running on it and trying to find 11 player teams, which will be high performing. So here is the Pareto front, here is the trade off front. There are some teams that are excellent in batting, some team excellence in bowling, some that are kind of mixed up, right? And you see there is this Chennai Super King that I put there as a dot. That was the team which won in 2010. And we did this study in 2010, won the league. And I played with that team's composition to my, my teams that I come up with. And there are so many of these teams that are at the mid part of this Pareto front are playing better than the Chennai Super King. So these are of course on a computer simulation, not in actual, actual field. But what I'm trying to say is that these are good teams that we came up with, right? But the reason I'm showing you this is not for that. I'm showing you now, I'm going to do innovization now, and what I'm going to do is look into each of these teams. So every dot here has 11 players in them, right? So I collect all the players that are appearing at least once in these high-performing teams. I found that out of 129, there is only 29 of them that appears. Other hundred of them don't come at all in these high performing teams. Now if I am the team manager or team owner, I should be paying attention to purchase or have these 29, one of these 29 players here. I'm showing you in the right plot is the frequency of these, some of these players who are appearing more than one. So this kind of study, if you have the data, it can give you uh, really useful information of valuable elements in your, in your team or in your set that are the key, key things that you should be having, okay? You all have played tic-tac-toe, right? Uh, so we tried this on various kinds of games. This is the one I'm showing, it's very simple. You know how many different strategies there can be? It's a simple game. If you play it three, four times, you, 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 it's, 
you'll be very difficult to lose this game, right? You can draw. So most of the time you end up with a draw, but you can win with some strategies, but it's very difficult to lose this game. But we figured out there are 72,000 plus strategies that are possible, different ways you can play. And these are really all. There is not one less, not one more. Okay, so we actually found out all possibilities because it's a finite, finite state game, so we could do it. All, now I'm showing you here all those strategies that are never losing against some random teams that I'm playing it with. Never losing. And this top figure, as you see, are their performance. The, the x-axis saying how many times it is making a draw, and the y-axis is showing how many times it has won. So obviously our Pareto front is right there. We're trying to maximize the number of wins, minimize the number of draws. So you see those six, seven points that are drawn with the line? Those are the optimal strategies. They are making maximum number of wins, minimum number of draws. Now what I do is look into these strategies. These strategies are, tr are trees, actually. Different moves, strategic, strategical moves that they're making. So I analyze those six specific solutions and try to find out what is common in them. Is there anything common? I found these properties, which I'm showing you in the shaded box. First it says, if the opponent is one sort of winning, block it. Every one of those six, sorry, seven solution strategies have this property. Second one is that if the center is empty, occupy it. Okay? And the third one is coming is in that order, is that if the center is filled, occupy the corner first, if the corner is not available, then occupy the edge corner. These three rules is something you learn pretty quickly when you play this game, and then you will be invincible. You, you will not be able to, nobody can, you know, uh, 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 can win against you. But you may not win all the time, but if you keep this, it's a good winning strategy. So this is a problem I'm showing because it's a simple, small problem. I can compute every strategy. No optimization is done here, but I'm just doing the innovation to show that such a, useful thing can come out when you apply the innovization concepts. This multi-objectivization is also coming in in the form of design exploration. When you have a, dealing with the design space, the top set of bridges that we have designed here have one objective in mind. So only one objective of minimizing weight. You see, after a while, all your population members, these are all the population members, look very, very much the same. Bottom is where two objectives are put in, two conflicting objectives. Now you see how much diversity, how much variation. We have some of those optimal weight also there, but many, many other designs, so you can get some inspiration from. Particularly, this kind of multi-objective ob objectivization is very helpful when you're doing the conceptual design stage. When you have not conversed to any particular idea, this can be used as a search mechanism, okay? Okay, so let me now skip some things to speed up and show you the last thing about some of the advanced stuff. So one way these things is moving is decision making, emo with decision making. That's a, that's a big topic. How do you combine optimization and decision making together? How do you do many objective optimization? Like we have more than three or four objectives, like five, 10, 15, okay? So let me show you one or two of these things. With the decision making, there are basically three ways to do it. You could either make decision before, and then optimize, but that's like the classical way of doing it, which I'm not recommending you. The second is a posteriori, which is you first find all the points, and then you make a decision. You can possibly do it for two and three objectives, but taking it to many objectives, like 10 objectives, so many points you have to find, uh, it's almost out of question. So there is this interactive methods where you can combine both, um, both optimization and decision making together. So, uh, okay. Um, uh, I want to skip these things now, saying just one little thing is that there is this idea of reference point based approach where you come up with some reference point, which I'm showing it like a dot. As you can see on the left point, there are three dots. These are your aspiration points. And all you then do and go and find the respective part of the Pareto front that are closest to these reference points or aspiration points. So there are some methodologies called RNSJ2, which can do it for you. Okay, um, all right. Let me now talk a little bit about many objectives. So some of these methods I talked to you about, NSGA, NSGA2, SPA2, PESA, all these methods, they have difficulties in scaling over to four, five, or more than three objectives, they have issues. And there are some reasons which you have identified, um, identified really nicely. First thing is that a large fraction of the population becomes non-dominated, 
So it slows down the search. That's really the, the issue. Again, let me not go into the very detail of it. But so we have beaten this problem. You see how exponentially the number of points become non-dominated with iteration. So we have now came up with NSGA3. And here are some results of NSGA3. The papers are still out, so you can have a look into that. The same three objective problem I showed you before with some holes in it with NSGA2 that I get. But look at here. Look at the top left picture. How nice a distribution you can get. And there are different kinds of points. On the right side, this is called PCP, parallel coordinate plot, where I'm solving 15 objective problems. So NSGA3 is able to solve 15 objective problem. And this is showing all these Pareto optimal solutions have a nice structure in that 15 dimensional. I cannot obviously show you 15 dimensional space. So that's why I'm showing you with the PCP concept here. So a uh, few other methods have come up. And I believe uh, um, um, uh, Professor Takahashi also here is working on some of these ideas. So this is becoming a very latest uh, research in the area of, of uh, emo. Yeah, this is another practical problem called water. OK, if you're interested in parallel processing, one other thing you can do in this area is that if you have three processors, you divide the task. For each processor, your goal is to find one part of the Pareto front. OK, so you can change, you can make the focus different from each of these each of these emo algorithms, they're running independently of different processor. Once in a while, they're talking to each other. And we've done a very simple analysis of that. We are planning to continue in this, where you can see that this three processor is supposed to find these three different regions independently, and then they will combine. We have actually simulated it, and you can see that that's happening. So these are some ideas I'm showing you, which have a lot of research uh, potential. Uh, if any of you are interested, can follow it up. Another thing in practice that comes is the robustness, which means there are uncertainties in your decision variable. So here is an example on the right side I'm showing. Uh, if you have an objective function that's changing like that, one point can be the global optima. But if you cannot achieve that global optima properly, you are really bad. On the other hand, there exists, exists a robust optima that is pretty shallow. That means even if there is fluctuations, you are not too bad. So in practice, people are interested in finding that robust optima. When you convert this to a multi-objective scenario, you now see that some part of the Pareto front can be a robust, and some other part cannot be robust. So you get a different front, which is now robust. So your goal will be then go and find those entire robust frontiers. So these are some new areas for research again. There are different ways I have defined what is called the robust. When you have constraints and uncertainty, you get into these chance constraints and what is known as reliability-based optimization. Now you have to specify some reliability against failure, and then you can do reliability-based multi-objective optimization. What happens there is the whole front now moves inside the feasible region. Okay? So then you need to figure out how much to move for a given reliability. Uh, we've been do doing a lot of automated machine learning methods to do innovation, which means you are getting this set of points coming from NSJ3 or NSJ2. You need an algorithm now which will take this as input and will churn out what are the rules that are hidden in this data. So it's more or less like data mining, but we're using sophisticated machine learning methods to identify those rules. Again, I'm not going into the details, just giving an idea. What happens is if you can identify these rules early on in your population as you're running, for example, in SGA2, like here is one example. We are running it on a practical problem. It was a metal cutting problem. And we are seeing that there are some, these are the solutions that are forming. They're kind of laying out in some way in the population. Has not converged yet, but I see there are some patterns in them. If you can identify that early, then you can pose them as a rule. Like these are some rules that I'm imposing now from this generation on, and pretty quickly, I get a fast convergence. Because I could extract what rules are present in the current non-dominated points, and I could use them as a repair mechanism. And that helps me get uh, faster convergence of my algorithm. And we have used these ideas in few industries. One I want to mention is Volvo with Swed in Sweden. And they are, we've done this study in 2001, sorry, 2011. And since then, they are making about a million euro savings of cost reduction in their new plant, new um, uh, uh, processing plant that they have. Uh, it's, it's a process layout that they have. They have completely re revised that using the results of EMO. And every year, they're saving about a million euro on this. So here are the commercial softwares. I want to say these are general purpose software, but there are specific 
softwares that are also available, like Emo Sherpa, which is in HIDS MDO from Red Cedar Technology from Michigan, then Mort Frontier in Estico from Italy, uh, Visual Doc from Vendorplatz again in US, uh, Optimas from uh, I think from Belgium, Belgium, but this is part of the Dassault systems, and of course the MATLABs, MathWorks has some. Uh, multi-objective optimization code, but these are commercial softwares, but there are lots of lots of public domain software. Our website has quite a few, NSGA2, NSGA, and a few others. Um, other, JMetal and PISA, there are quite a few websites. You can download codes, and you can try it on your problem. All right, so in terms of future in this area, I already mentioned a few things. Uh, we are going in for many objective. V when you have many objectives, like 10 objectives or so, visualization becomes a very important issue. So how do you visualize a 10-dimensional surface? So we are progressing in that, but there are a lot of research is needed over here. Uh, integration with the decision making I mentioned, bi-level stuff that I talked to you about in the last, last uh, lecture, uh, you could do bi-level multi-objective. So that's, that's another interesting area, which could be very much application in control systems. Some theoretical um, basis for are we really getting to the multi-objective optimal solutions or not? So we are also working on some of those ideas. Distributed parallel computing, I mentioned meta modeling needs to be worked out. There are only few few research in meta modeling ideas uh, in in emo. Uh, then there are a lot of other things. I think we need to have unified approaches for mono, multi, and many. Uh, one thing that I'm finding is that all of them has a letter M in them. So I can call them emo. And I can still say I'm doing, instead of single ob evolutionary single objective op optimization, I can say evolutionary mono-objective optimization. That, so that, that's a nice emo, kind of a unified emo. Um, some point we should be thinking about solving 100 plus objectives. So I'm talking about those being evolutionary massive objective optimization, right? Again with an M. Um, many things are, are there on the pipeline. And I think it's just, I would not say the beginning, but quite in an advanced stage, but we see a lot of opportunities to go from here, simply because the practice is quite interested. Practice is very much interested in using these methods, because nothing in practice is single objective, and they're looking for methods to solve it. OK, so I think I skipped the conclusion part or not? Oh, OK, it's later. Um, there is a conference coming up. Unfortunately, the deadline is in one week or 10 days' time, um, 30th September, but it's going to be in Portugal. Um, we had one in Oro Preto back in um, 2011, I believe, right? So now it has gone to Portugal. Um, so this is dedicated completely in this field. It happens every, every other year. All right. So to conclude my talk here is that I thought I managed to show you it's a fast-growing field with lots of ideas in it. Um, and then uh, it's an exciting part of the whole computational intelligence uh, topic. Uh, there are a lot of practical applications that are coming, and that's keeping it surviving. Uh, there are MCDM concepts needs to be built up with EMO. The mathematical optimization concepts can be built up with EMO, and it's diversifying. That's why commercial softwares are available. That's something, you know, didn't happen in the single objective arena much. But in multi-objective, we see that's happening because there is, there is need from the practice. So other, other softwares are also available, like freely, you don't have to buy one. Uh, you, can, you can do your research downloading these freely available softwares. Okay, again, I think I know I've overshoot my time, but um, if there are some questions and time permits, I will be happy to take. Due to time constraints, uh, we will have only one question. <laughs> who, who ask you? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's about the measure, the performance of yeah. multi objective optimization. Uh, there are a lot of uh, metrics like hypervolume, mm -hmm. spacing, number of known donate solutions. I think. And uh, in your opinion, uh, for problems that uh, we don't know the, the Pareto Pareto uh, optimal, then we cannot uh, calculate the error yeah. uh, between the, the Pareto front and the optimal, uh, which could be the best uh, yeah. metrics yeah. to choose uh, between one algorithm or another. 
yeah, good question. Um, so hyper volume is a metric that doesn't require the knowledge of the Pareto front. All you need is a reference point and you're computing and there is a proof that um, if, you in, if you maximize the hyper volume, the points that you get are always on the Pareto front. So that, that's a motivation, but, but given two point, sets of points, one having hyper, uh, higher hyper volume doesn't mean you have a better distribution, okay? So, but then in general, hyper volume is preferred in that case. I would recommend you to do that. Uh, now, the other thing you could do in order to compare different methods is, let's say algorithm A had found one set. Algorithm B has given you another set. Now you combine them together, okay? Make a bigger set, remove all the dominated points, and then you've got the resulting set of points that are coming from these two, and then you see what proportion of these bigger set coming from algorithm A1 and algorithm A2. And so that proportion can tell you which one has contributed more to this bigger set. So these are some ways you can compare different methods. Uh, but I 100% agree with you that much of the metrics that we have requires you to have the knowledge of the Pareto front. But some of these new ones are coming out uh, that, are, uh, that do not require. Uh, so I find either hypervolume or collection of different sets and then doing that proportionate study is a good way to go. Good way to go. Okay. Professor, that will be available tomorrow for talk yeah. with the interested people. Now we must thank him for his lecture. Thank you very much. Pessoal, é, na verdade nós temos então agora programada a primeira parte da, da aula do professor Kumar e a ideia é que a, a gente é, levante aí só uns cinco minutinhos para esticar as pernas enquanto ele se instala né, sem, sem coffee break.